Thank you, and help me welcome uh, James Hamilton. Hope you enjoy it. Much. Just after the probably four hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this was the film that you know when I asked you, shall we show something? And you said Rear Window. Rear Window. Um, uh, I saw it when I was eight years old. Um, I lived in uh, uh, mainline Philadelphia, um, and a lot of people who lived in Philadelphia would go to the Jersey Shore for the summer. So I would basically do three things. I would, be, I would either be in the ocean, the bowling alley, where I set up pins in the bowling alley, my first job, and played pinball, or the movies. And so one August night, I went to see this. And um, fell in love with three things. Grace Kelly, <laughs> um, Alfred Hitchcock, and uh, the idea of having the kind of life that Jimmy Stewart had. Where I, I never knew what I would be doing from day to day. Um, and that happened uh, because I became a photographer. I wasn't interested in photography. Uh, I didn't know anything about photography, but I painted and drew and, well, ever since my earliest years. So I went to art school. And uh, Pratt, <laughs> I studied at Pratt. And I went for, t I went for two years, and um, a couple of friends of mine from high school said, why don't you s spend the summer in the city, summer of 66? And I thought, what a great idea. So uh, they happened to find an apartment, and I moved in with them. The apartment was in the neighborhood where Jimmy Stewart lives. As a matter of fact, when he says, meet me at the bar at the Albert Hotel, the Albert Hotel is right across the street from my apartment. I still live in that apartment. <laughs> and those guys moved out. I kept it. So, uh, and the reason I kept it was I had to get a job. So I found a job working for a, uh, for a friend of a friend. I heard that a, a fashion photographer needed an assistant. And uh, I, I said, I don't know anything about photography. And the, and the person said, well, why don't you go see him anyway? So I went up to meet a photographer named Alberto Rizzo, who was a fashion photographer. And we uh, hit it off. And he hired me on the spot to be his assistant. And that's where I learned how to want to be a photographer. So I borrowed his camera and went out into the street and had a fantastic time taking pictures and loved every minute of it. So I stayed on for two years and I never went back to Pratt. So I gave up painting, drawing for photography. Um, so um, that was, and I kind of trace it back to this kind of life, where of a, the life of a photojournalist. And so this was, it had a big effect on me. I mean, incidentally, I mean, I, I didn't intend to move into the neighborhood where Jimmy Stewart lived, but I happened to. So it was uh, interesting. I also, uh, for a long time, went with a woman named Lisa. <laughs> but then I found the woman that Jimmy Stewart was looking for in 1989, named Kathy Doby. <laughs> really, <laughs> that woman uh, that he was looking for. So, um, so those are just things about the movie that that, uh, but. Uh, the other thing was that uh, I loved film noir. I loved dark movies. And I guess I was that kid, too, you know, sort of film nerd who um, liked darker movies. Tell us a little bit about your movie-going uh, habits. Clearly, you started very, very young. I did. Uh, because there weren't movies on TV, I went to the movies, and there were, you know, you could see double features for, for a quarter. I remember seeing a, a film called The Killing 
by, uh, with another feature, I don't remember what it was, it's a Stanley Kubrick film, an early, very early Stanley, 1950, I was 10 then, and, uh, and it was made very inexpensively, obviously, and it was extremely clever because he played with different viewpoints of the same heist robbery. It's a racetrack robbery movie. And um, I, uh, I just thought, well, you could do this. You know, you could really make a movie, you know, because it wasn't a big Hollywood movie. And it looked like it just didn't cost much. And it was, it was the invention that, that drew me to that kind of film. Um, you know, low budget, smart, black and white. Black and white, always. I love black and white. So, um, so that was became part of my photography later on too. You know, sort of the lighting and the kind of street photography I did. Can you can you talk a little bit more about the lighting, the way noir lighting and high contrast? Uh, as, it, as, it, it was you know, I, 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 when I would do a portrait, I would always carry my own lighting and all that, um, where whatever job I did, but. Um, what lights do you would you carry? I, w I would use strobe light or you know available light or what, whatever. But I li I loved playing with light, and I, it wasn't as if I did a lot of noir lighting. But I loved the idea of, of film black and white and playing with light, uh, and that was certainly certainly inspired by those films. Uh, just the idea of it, the idea of playing with black and white and, and light. And why do you think you said it last night as well, and and, and repeated today? That um, why black and white most? Uh, more? Uh, I was, I just I see in black and white, I guess, and uh, and partly from movies, the kind of movies I liked, but also um, I don't know. I just um, was never really drawn to color photography, and I I would never say I mastered it. I had to do it because well, magazines wanted it. And eventually, even the newspapers I worked for wanted color photography. But um, I, most of my photography was in black. Most of my prints in the early days were all black and white for the publications. I was at the Village Voice for 20 years, and that was all black and white up until you know much later. Uh, I got away with doing all black and white for the New York Observer for 15 years and did a couple portraits a week or things like that. I mean, there were anyone I wanted to do. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I could take any picture, two pictures a week that are anything I wanted, which is a dream. It's, it's that kind of lured me away from the village voice. I got, they paid me more money and they said you could do two pictures a week that are anything you want, which is un impossible to turn down. And they ran them really big, so it's great. And it wasn't. It wasn't out of paper that was particularly known for photography because the cover was always a, an illustration by wonderful illustrators. New York's best illustrators would do a block of a, of a illustration for the cover. My pictures are only on the inside. You you said that sometime when you wanted to meet someone, you know, some filmmaker that you yeah, like, right. you you decided well, you Hitchcock. Yeah. So can you t tell us a little bit about your I, first? Well, I was I was staff photographer at Harper's Bazaar, which is also funny because Bazaar is mentioned several times in this film. I became the staff photographer at Harper's Bazaar, um, and uh, I uh, photographed. I, I didn't do any fashion except fashion shows, but I um, did. Uh, a lot and a lot of parties. I became their party photographer, and they pages of parties, and it was it was enormous fun. Um, because in those days, people did not want to look in the camera, so I could catch everything, and so I, I felt invisible. I felt like I was floating around in a bubble, taking pictures, which was so much fun. And um, and I did a lot of portraits, and a lot of the portraits I did. I set up for myself because I had the entree of the publication. It wasn't necessarily an assignment. And so Hitchcock was in town um, to promote the movie Frenzy and um, 1972. So I, um, I, I told somebody in the art department I wanted to photograph Hitchcock and they didn't care. And I said, well, so they set it up for me. And I 
I went to the St. Regis, where he always stayed. I opened the door, and I mean, he, I knock on the door, he opens the door, and there he is with his wife standing there. And she orders up tea. There's no press people there, no handlers or anything like that. It's just three of us in the room for a few hours and uh, just talking, having a ball, because I knew so much about his films. And um, uh, so I did not take all that many pictures because we were engaged otherwise. Um, but I do have a picture upstairs that I like very much um, of him laughing. And uh, you want to tell that other story? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Um, a few years later, he was in town, and who do I encounter but Grace Kelly? Because she was part of a celebration of him that was at Lincoln Center. And uh, so I photographed her and him in a sort of paparazzi way. And then uh, I, I know that there's going to be a press conference the next day, so I go there. And, um, and he's looking very up, very bummed out. He doesn't want to be there. Um, and somewhat depressed, he seemed. So I, um, I remembered a scene from North by Northwest. People know North by Northwest. And if, if you haven't seen it, I'll ruin it. But, uh, but at the end of the movie, uh, James Mason and Martin Landau who are the spies, find out that G. Marie Saint is a, is a spy, for, you know, spying for the feds. And uh, they're going to fly off with her. And because they now know, they find out that uh, she's, a, she's the enemy, they're going to throw her out of the plane. And Cary Grant sneaks into the house. He's upstairs on a balcony and realizes he's got to warn her somehow without putting her in danger or him and anyone in danger. So um, he, he gets some, takes a matchbook out that has his initials on it, R-O-T, Rot, that we've seen earlier in the film, that she's seen. And he writes something on the matchbook, inside the matchbook, and tosses it to her. And he's waiting for her to find it on the floor. And we are too. And then he leans, she leans down, picks it up, opens it up, closes it quickly, and basically knows he's up there. So she goes, I forgot something. She, she, she goes upstairs. So in remembering that, I took out a matchbook <laughs> and I wrote what he had written in that matchbook and handed it across the table to Hitchcock, and he opened it up and read, they're on to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he cracked up. So that was the second time I made Hitchcock laugh. It was, it was, uh, it made the press, rest of the press conference kind of fun for him, uh, I hope. What do you think, uh, what do you think makes Rear Window one of his uh, uh, best? It's, well, it's so much about, I mean, hundreds of reaction shots. And what's interesting, as I said to you earlier, is that uh, Jimmy Stewart is reacting to nothing. There's nothing for him as, as an actor. He's reacting, to, he's an, on an empty soundstage, basically. So we see the, him reacting to everything, but he's really reacting to nothing. So, and it takes a really good actor to pull that off. Um, and essentially, he's, not, he's doing very little but it's got to work, and it's got, and it's simple, but it's harder than it looks, I think. And he seemed to be a master at that kind of thing, and um, engages us that way. But uh, yeah, there's no nothing to react against. He doesn't have an actor, as most actors do, have somebody across them to react to or to you know work off of, and he's not. So that's a challenge. But it's mostly that, I mean, what Hitchcock called it was his, his most purely cinematic film. 
because you see somebody's, he looks, we see what he sees, and then we see his reaction. And that's very much what the film is about, and um, which is, as Hitchcock calls it, pure cinema. And and um, in the um, in the documentary Uncropped, uh, uh, you know about about your work that that David directed, uh, Wes Anderson, who's uh, was one of the producers, executive producers yeah. of the of the film, says, uh, talking about you, says he is the Jimmy Stewart character in Rear Window. That's well, the guy. because it's well, I did live that life, and I mean he, it appears that he is. Uh, I mean, he is uh, working for a magazine, which looks like life because they show yeah. that, re the red. Re that red banner on the bottom of the thing. And he did photograph not just wars, he photographed everything, obviously a fashion I mean, a model on the cover of Pseudo Life magazine. So, um, I'm the, I ask I, uh, uh, Wes when he says, you, oh, you are the Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, so I kind of I kind of lived the life of a... Of a I'm of a that kind of a journalist, you know. Again, where I never knew what I was doing from one day to the next. I mean, I, I was uh, I was at Tiananmen Square when it all blew up, um, for instance, and and yet I was photographing restaurant reviews. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was doing the the most minor things, and you know, really far flung journalism. So um, so I did live that life in a way and millions and millions of portraits, of course. And for my own pleasure, I was documenting my life in New York, photographing in the street, and, which I have, more, I have more photos of street life in New York than anything. Yeah, and one could argue that although this was all shot in a studio, this is new street life in New York as... Uh, oh, yeah. And, as it happens, yeah. And, I mean, if, if they had had uh, production design awards, which they didn't... Oscars for production design. This certainly would have won an Oscar, I think, because um, it was kind of an outlandish set, really. It was 30, 31 apartments, and I think seven were were furnished for the film in the film. Um, so it was, it was. I think he Hitchcock loved the cha loved a challenge, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, I was talking about this earlier that. Uh, he in this early '60s or 1960, he 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 noticed that um, cheap films could make a lot of money, like uh, drive-in movies. So he wanted to make the ultimate drive-in movie, and he wanted to do it on the cheap. So he, he was, at first it was going to be a black and white movie. He was going to use, he had a, you know, his half-hour TV show. He was going to use the crew from the show, cameraman, everything from the TV show. And uh, basically he made the first slasher movie with Psycho, which was, the ultimate, in a way, the ultimate drive-in movie still is, in a lot of ways. But, uh, and then he decides, um, I'm going to yank the rug out and kill the star, you know, early on. So we, so you're, the, the audience is abandoned, and they don't know who to, who, who who they're with or who what's what's going on. So it was a really interesting challenge for him, I think, and this was too. Actually, the same year, which I only just found out because I didn't know this, I I had seen Dial M for Murder, not in 3D. If anyone saw it here in 3D, it was probably a treat. But um, he made it the same year. Yeah. And it came out only several months before this. It came out in May, and then his film, which just happened, was a heat wave, it takes place in a heat wave, came out in August of the same year. Yeah, I think a he perfect had perfect summer movie, really. Yeah, I think he had to satisfy a contract with Warner Brothers with Dial M. It was something like well, this that. This is Paramount. Yeah, this is Paramount. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, he, he and got Dial that. Dial M was yeah, Warner's. Yeah, it was Warner's. So I think he satisfied that's the, why the he had contract. To do that. But this is clearly a big, a, a yeah. biggest challenge. But they were both one, one, basically one room movies. Or, I mean, yeah. the character was one room. Yeah, I was thinking as I was watching before because we just did Dial M recently. The yeah. same, the system would, you know, where they see this. The, the, the depth of the use of depth of field, you know, in the mm. street where you can see street life, it, almost into the bar, you know, across right, the street right. and the rooms and yeah. and uh, through the rooms. And he figured, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a one room movie, but I'm going to do it in 3D, <laughs> <laughs> which is like already an, another challenge. Yeah. I mean, he he was fun that way. 
which other filmmaker you sought after? Well, you know, can you can you give us another example? I think George Romero was one. What did you like about his film? Uh, I like I, most of all, I like the well, Night of the Living Dead is a po very powerful. You know, whatever it is is a very powerful movie. Um, t it was to me. It's still hard to watch in a way. Um, I mean, it's frightening. Um, but I love the way he wor worked. You know, the same way I love the way Kubrick worked. I love I love the way. And I love the way Wes works. Uh, I, I love people who, who are, I like deliberate artists who work as independently as they possibly can. And, um, and I love the way George worked, you know, had his own little, you know, center in, in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. And he, you know, made what he wanted to make. And he, you know, he made them as expensively as he could, well, not very. Um, so it was, I just, I just admired that kind of, you know, and Wes, you know, has total control over his movies. He's a, he's a dear friend. And, um, for, for, for who doesn't know, James has photographed some of his, uh, he's been set photographer for Wes Anders or some of, some of this. Right. Of and, and again, whenever I wanted, are upstairs, when, yeah. whenever I wanted to meet somebody like George Romero and Wes, I would just make an, make up an assignment and go photograph them. And and it was George Romero who said, you know, we totally hit it off, loved the same movies, just had a wonderful time. I went down to Pittsburgh to meet. I, I, I got a guy named Tom Allen who worked at The Voice to do the interview on the phone, and I ran down to Pittsburgh to meet him, photograph him, and hang out. And we just hit it off, and he said, well, why don't you do be still do the stills on my movies? And I said, yeah, but don't I have to be in the union? He said, I'll get you in. And so I spent the summer of 1980 in rural rural Pittsburgh photographing uh, Night Riders. Night Riders, which is a movie we're showing tomorrow at four. And if you don't know it, I highly recommend seeing it because it's rarely screened, and it's a very, it's an anomaly for George Romero. And yet, it's one of more, the most quintessential Romero films that I that I can think of. It was very, it was very exciting. It was. Uh, uh, jousting, knights jousting on motorcycles. But you have to see it to see what I mean. And um, and in in a lot of ways, you know, violent. But um, and there was well, we're getting off the track. But uh, no, no, police was but talking anyway. About so and there it was mostly made up of uh, the cast was mostly made up of uh, stunt people, not actors, but you know, guys hidden beneath helmets on on motorcycle. And um, so it was, there were injuries like mad, ambulances running back and forth all <laughs> throughout the throughout the film. But um, so it was in, an interesting summer. And St Stephen King down came down, and the three of us would hang out and go to dinner and or talk movies all night. He put St Stephen King in that movie. Then did a movie the next year that I also worked on called Creep Show that Stephen King wrote. Right. They put you in the movie as well. And they put me in the movie. I've been put in a lot of movies. Wes Anderson puts me in his movies. Noah Baumbach puts me in his movies. And um, George did. But, you know, I'm thinking you said the way that you like the way they work. But yes, they're very, both, you know, Kubrick, Wes Anderson, and, and George Romero are, you know, incredibly independent directors, but they are so wildly different in their style. And George yeah. could work for very little. Kubrick made very expensive films. Wes makes very elaborate films. Wes and Kubrick do a lot of takes. That's one, one similarity. But, um, but and Wes is, is a writer-director, so I mean, Kubrick wrote some of his scripts, but Wes writes all, everything uh, with somebody, some else, sometimes, but, yeah. And what Wes has is somebody who kind of bankrolls him. I mean, does bankroll him, and uh, which is amazing to have one guy bankroll your films and successfully. And Kubrick never. You, you wrote to Kubrick, and he never. <laughs> <laughs> when he when he when he was doing Barry Lyndon, uh, I I actually wrote him. I mean, I read the book. I, I didn't know anything about what it was going to be like, but I imagined that it would be fun to photograph. So I, I wrote him and sent a bunch of pictures um, in the hopes that maybe I could get a job working as, as a still photographer on that film. But uh, he wrote back and said, uh, or 
somebody wrote back for him probably and said uh, that they, he didn't like to use still photographers. And he actually did often use frames from the film. So whoever was on the set, my God, there, there must have been somebody taking stills, but he didn't really like somebody else around if he could avoid it. Was there ever anyone that you refused to photograph? In film, film that refused to photograph? That you refused to photograph? No. No? No. I got along with everybody. Except <laughs> Mike Dukakis. <laughs> <laughs> he would not do anything I asked him to do. But anyway. I mean, memorably. Anyway, if you look at the contact sheet, he's looking exactly the same in every frame. <laughs> But um, I never shot a great deal of film anyway when I, when I did a portrait. Um, uh, for one thing, there wasn't any much time. When the press junkets came in, you had 10 minutes with somebody, which was 10 minutes in a hotel room. So I would take, um, you'll see if you go upstairs, I would take a, a black velvet or a white sheet, and I would throw uh, light on the white sheet to make it pure white, and the black velvet would absorb the light, so it would be a black background. So those are my two choices, because all the hotel rooms, often they looked exactly the same. And there was after a while, there was nothing to work with in a hotel room. It wasn't, the, the environment meant nothing to the picture, so I made my own environment, made my own studio. I had, uh, and in my apartment, I had a, the same thing. I had a, a rolled up paper that I would bring down, and, uh, shoot in my studio in my apartment which is not very big but at all but uh, i did all my work in my apartment i developed everything i ever shot printed everything i ever shot without water in my kitchen dark room so i had to use the bathroom for everything uh, everything that involved water and and uh, almost all the photographs that are upstairs, he just printed them for. They were for digital. This they were inkjet di digital prints. But you you still made them, huh? You still made them. I still I I still make darkroom prints when I want to, <laughs> and I made all these. Yeah. Um, yesterday you except, except for three, three are gigantic, and I couldn't do it. Uh, uh, yesterday you said something, you said that one of the things that you, you know, you, I, I don't think you used the word regret, but it was like, you know, that you would have liked also to do is to do more, to be more in Los Angeles. So, so to have more for access. Well, for instance, because I did like, I did like uh, hanging out with and, and photographing film, filmmakers. Um, I, uh, I guess I, I photograph more artists than, than anybody, I think, uh, artists of one kind or another. So. I mean, with joy, I did, you know, but I thought of gangsters, politicians, every, everything you can think of. Um, but I liked photographing artists the most. Musicians, I did a whole book of musicians. Um, and uh, pinball, I did a book about pinball. <laughs> I was, <laughs> incidentally, I, I was doing an issue for G G uh, GQ magazine. It was the fun issue, the Christmas issue. And the managing editor loved pinball, so he did a piece about pinball. And then he, he said, why don't we, we have enough pictures, why don't we put a dummy together and do a book? And I said, who wants a book about pinball? But apparently a lot of people did, because it was Tommy who was out in 1976, and so I wound up going around the world photographing pinball. Slave to the subject of pinball for, for a year. <laughs> but then I had to do my still my staff job too at the, at, at, for the Village Voice at the same time. So it was not easy. But, but what, what do you think it is about the filmmakers that you that you that you have an affinity? Because yes, you, I, you they, say in the documentary, so you never wanted to make. Well, it. as it really did kind of start with Hitchcock that that I uh, I admired filmmakers more than almost anybody as as artists. Uh, I didn't know any painters. I didn't know. Any, many movie makers either, but I just enjoyed film so much that I ad admired film directors. And one would have thought that maybe I would have sought that out myself, but I uh, liked working alone. And also I found out after working on film sets that the only good job is the director. And <laughs> well, except my job. I loved being a still photographer because I had run of the place. I could take pictures any, anywhere all day and uh, had total access. And I treated it like a documentary film 
So it was much more fun than just producing images for the for publicity. Uh, so I shot a lot of film, and I did shoot film. I didn't shoot digital until the the film Darjeeling Limited. So Royal Royal Tenenbaums and and uh, all of George's stuff and all that stuff. Oh, that and several films were all um, Noah Baumbach's film, uh, Squid and the Whale. They were all done with film. And, and there upstairs, you see the difference between his portrait and also the set, you know, the variety of the, uh, of the set. Uh, set photos, photos, yeah. Photos, yeah. <laughs> and it was, it's not the, it's not the, it's not the, the, uh, the most, uh, normally it's not the most fun job, but I made it a lot of fun. It's, you can see it from the photograph. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is a question. No. You? No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Are we running out of time? Is that what you were saying? Does anybody have any question? I think we're. Right. Oh yeah, there is one here and then one in the back. Yeah. Okay, we'll start from the back since. Uh, the simple question: Do you have a single favorite film, like one film that stands uh, above I, the I rest? Much, I probably say what everyone says. I love Citizen Kane. Um, but I also but the but film the films that I watch over and over I, there are certain films that I watch over and over again. So I, I, you'd have to call them favorites too. I love Treasure of Sierra Madre. I love this. I love um, yeah. I, there are certain films I just can't turn off when they show up on TV. Um, but Kane, you know, my mother said, you know, stay home from school. Citizen Kane's on TV. This is when I was like, you know nine or ten or something like that so it was an easy film to fall in love with apart from the fact that it's great george also li uh, liked wells and and nobody thinks that he you know he's a wells that's, a, well, that's interesting yeah wells is wonderful and there was a question here i think you have a photograph upstairs of robert mitchum laughing and i'm not sure i've ever we were seen high a, you were <laughs> high thank you for answering i walked that question. In, i walked i walked in he's a big man actually he's a big guy right yeah he's a big guy and i felt very small and he immediately came over to me and bear hugged me and i felt my bones cracking and it was we were off to the races and then we lit he up. he was already high when you came in he was high and we lit up <laughs> i was wondering i was wondering if you were aware of the fact that he was asked once what he was most proud, what his proudest achievement was in life. Have you heard that story? Uh, maybe not. He said, my marital record. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was married, he was married to the same woman forever. I'm sure, I'm sure he might have, might have had some dalliances, but I don't know. But he, um, he, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, women loved him. Um, loved working with him because he, he 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 respected them. He gave them a lot of room, and he uh, like Jane Greer in, in uh, out, um, out of the past um, talks about how how generous he was and how you know, protective he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, that's a he, fantastic. He was, he was very protective, and I'll tell you one other story about about him that he was he was uh, he was at RKO. And he was work and the head of RKO at the time was Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes basically brought over beautiful Jean Simmons, and her husband came with her, and um, Stuart Granger, right? I think, and um, and this and this was because Hughes wanted to put the make on her, and um, and she rebuffed him, naturally, and. Uh, and he hired Preminger to do, to do the film Angel Face with Mitchum and her. And Preminger was being deliberately brutal, as he could be anyway. But he was being particularly hard because he, Howard Hughes was putting on the screws to, to be a, you know, what he was on that set. And Mitchum saw through the whole thing and, and, and threatened Preminger physically if he didn't lay off, and he did from then on. But he was, he was apparently very much like that with, with women. But he could, you know, if he drank too much, he could be, you know, not so nice. He also said once, you know, he went to jail for marijuana. Of course. <laughs> he later said, it was the only harmless day's work I ever <laughs> 
<laughs> well, normally it would have it would have it it would not have done not him done him done him much good to be busted for for pot, but it only enhanced his image because he was a bad boy. Last one, because. Up, which is about a photographer. That, I saw that at a pivotal. I saw that was it sixty six? It was around. I think it was sixty six. It was a pivotal time because here I am working for a fashion photographer, and that movie comes out, and um, I didn't want to be a fashion photographer, but but uh, it was it was he was supposed to be kind of be a, 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 a sort of a, a David Bailey character. David Bailey also did a lot of. Um, Journalism as well. I mean, as, um, as well as fashion. So um, it was interesting to me, and uh, but I, I love the film anyway. It's 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 almost Hitchcockian, you know. It's true. And uh, it's a mystery, and it's yeah, it's good, good film. I mean, who doesn't like Antonio? In, in that life, not not him. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I did not order women around on the set. <laughs> I didn't have a set. I, I think we, we, are, we, are, we have to go. <laughs> we are running into the next show. Okay. So thank you, thank you. Tomorrow, come and see Night Riders. And on April 26th, Uncropped is opening for a week. <laughs>